In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. What's in a name? The William Shakespeare asked. What's in a name? Are, are names important? Maybe, we seem to think, they're maybe not as important as we thought they were. Uh, Growing up, my mother's name was Sarah. And she would always have to specify how that was supposed to be spelled. And then when I got into school, my teachers would always ask people, well, which spelling is it? Even my brother, whose name is Connor, would have to specify, no, it's the old Irish way, not the new way, not the super new way. It's C-O-N-O-R not C-O-N-N-O-R or C-O-N-E-R or C-O-N-N-E-R or C-O-N-Y-R, I'm sure someone has come up with. We tinker with names. We try to make them unique, special, individual, although speaking from personal experience, having a fairly unique four-syllable name is not all it's cracked up to be because the more syllables you add, the more ability to change pronunciation people find within the name Jedediah. Names, we think, are important in some way, but what they mean may be a little bit less important. We, we prize, in some ways, novelty over a meaning behind the names that we give to things and people and places. And we forget that there's a meaning behind some of the important names that we have. After all, some of the old names, the traditional names, we don't see anymore. I remember my, my grandmother was very aggrieved the last time that I went to visit her that none of her great-grandchildren have been named after my grandmother's first and late husband, my grandfather, whose name was John. There have been three great, great grandchildren who could have been named John, four, excuse me, four great grandchildren who could have been named John, and none of them has been given that name. And she said, why doesn't anyone use the old names anymore, John or Michael? But names particularly to the people of Israel and in the first century, whether you were an Israelite or someone of the Greco-Roman world, were very important. In the Greco-Roman world, you named people names in order to give homage. So for example, the Roman town of Caesarea Philippi, King Philip, named for the Herodian King Philip, to, by the Herodian King Philip to honor Caesar. And the subject of most of today's gospel, Nathaniel, is a very important name. Because that last two letters are the same as the last two letters that Jacob uses in the Old Testament when he names the place where he dreams this dream of God and heaven and it being open and angels ascending and descending on a ladder. He calls it Bethel, the house of God. Bethel. And that name gives the place significance. Because this is where God dwells. This is the basis for calling church buildings the house of God. This concept that God dwells in this place. Not the only place God might dwell, but in this place, God certainly does dwell. But it's interesting because Jesus, speaking with Nathaniel, takes this idea of God and appending God's name to things like Michael or Nathaniel or Daniel, all E-L names, right? Ending in E-L, all of God. 
he takes this idea of Bethel from Genesis. And he tells Nathaniel, it's not interesting. It's not important. It's not what you think it is that I saw you under the fig tree. What's important is what it means that I am here with you. Because remember, think back to Christmas. I know it was a long time ago at this point and coming soon again. What's the name we give Jesus at Christmas? Emmanuel. God with us. Not in a place. Not at Bethel. Not in Jerusalem but with us. And Jesus promises in today's gospel that Nathaniel and all the disciples who are around and listening will see heaven opened, much like Jacob did, and angels ascending and descending, not on the temple in Jerusalem, not on a high mountain, not in, a spe in any particular place but upon the Son of Man, Jesus, God with us. Because it's not about, Jesus is saying, the place. To be sure, there are places where God feels nearer, where we are more aware of God in relationship with us, present with us. But Jesus' promise is that God is with us because we are us. God is with us because of Jesus being with us now and forever. It is not that God will dwell in a certain place and we have to come to God in that place. It is that God is with us and we have to come to the realization that God is with us wherever we are. God is with us here. Now, not in any place, but for all time, in all places. If you remember that childhood classic, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, at the end, after all of the adventures, the four siblings are speaking with their host, the professor. And they ask the professor, do you think we'll ever go back? And he says, oh, no, not by that way anyway, meaning through the wardrobe. And they're shocked. Well, isn't it always open? He says, no, it's not about the place. It's not about the place. It's not about getting the right door or turning the right combination to access that new, that experience that you had. It's about being aware of the moment when it happens wherever you think it might be. And through the rest of those books, the entry into Narnia is on all sorts of places, right when the children least expect it. God is with us and we become aware of it in places where we least expect expect it to be. And sometimes in places that we would prefer God wasn't with us. Sometimes God shows up on I-5 in the car with us when we're stuck in traffic. And we would like to say certain things to the other drivers around us. But God is with us. And so maybe that's not the best idea. In the Benedictine life, they have a central tenet of their life together that says God is not elsewhere. The other, way we, the other way we talk about it is the vow of stability. To be in this place through these things for the long haul. But really you can summarize it as God is not elsewhere. Everything we need to be with God in relationship in communion, is here, now, with us. Whether in the Benedictine community, that is in the chapel singing all of the psalms, all 150 psalms at 3 in the morning, 
or in the kitchen doing the dishes or just sitting and reading in your room. God is not elsewhere. God truly is with us. When I lived in St. Louis, <clears throat> I was on a fall day, which is the only time you can do this because the sun is just warm enough and the air is just cool enough to make it comfortable, walking to an appointment. About one day a year you can do that in St. Louis, maybe two. I was walking to an appointment and I was maybe a touch late. And I saw someone walking towards me and I saw that moment when he saw that I had a collar on. And I saw him realize what that meant and, I, and then he stopped walking. And I thought to myself, oh, okay, that's, that's different. I wasn't sure if he was going to step off the sidewalk and let me pass, either for good reasons or bad, doesn't matter. Or he was going to turn and run the other way, which is an experience I've had before. I'm not, I wasn't sure what was going to happen. Uh, and when I got to him, within about three feet of him, he said, hey, can I ask you a question? because I was in my collar and I was very aware of the fact that I was in my collar and representing something that was more than myself. I uh, squelched the, the urge to look at my watch and I said, of course. Now I was already late so I figured in for a penny, in for a pound. Go ahead and ask a question, I said. And the man looked at me and said, is God with me? I was a little confused. I said, well, what do you mean? He says, well, I, I want to know if, if God is with me. Is God with us right here, right now? I, I can't get to church on Sunday, he said. I, I work 12 hours a day on Sunday, and I can't get to church. Either I can't get to your church, I can't get to my church, I can't get to any church on a Sunday. And, and things have happened in my life that I just feel like God has abandoned me. And so I, I need to know, has God abandoned me? Is God angry at me because I haven't been to church on Sunday? Is God with us? And I said, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to hear that things are challenging in your life. But yes, absolutely, without question, God is with you. God is with us here, right now. And then he asked, can I pray with you? And generally, when people ask, can I pray with you? In the Episcopal Church, what they mean is, can we stand together and you pray? Because you're the priest. And I was fully expecting that that was the expectation. And so I, I said, of course. And then I took a breath to begin praying. And then he started praying before I could even uh, make it, uh, finish taking a breath in. He said, God, I, I, just want to, I just want to thank you. There have been such, so many hard things in my life. Um, but I know that you put this person in my life to walk across my path and tell me that you have not abandoned me. And so I just wanted to say thank you, God. Amen. He said, thank you, Father. Thank you. That was, thank you so much. And then he turned and walked away before I could get in that breath that I had taken in in preparation to pray out. God is not elsewhere. There may be places where God feels nearer to us, feels closer. It might feel like there's a ladder between that place and heaven with angels coming down and up to bring us the good news that God loves us and wants to be in relationship with us. But even when we are not in those places, even when we are not in Bethel, the house of God, God is with us. And so are God's messengers, the angels, and everything that constitutes God's reality and relationship with us. God is absolutely with us here and now and always. If only we can remember that that is true.
Amen.